to thank you on behalf of the Occupational Health and Safety Section of the American Public Health Association for inviting us here today. And I'm pleased on behalf of all of my colleagues in this section to award you the Alice Hamilton Award. And thank you very much. We're sorry that you won't be able to join us in person, but so am I. this is the next best thing. So I hope that we'll have a few minutes for you to chat and tell us a little bit about your life and about how you got into the field and maybe end up by giving us, giving us some advice on what you think we should be doing. Oh, well, you're taking a chance to ask me to talk about the field because after five years as a country doctor and five years looking after normal Radcliffe girls, I found uh, the work at the uh, Department of Labor, Massachusetts uh, Division of Occupational Hygiene fascinating. Tabor Shaw had left and on his desk were cases that he hadn't finished studying. And some of these turned out to be from Sylvania in Danvers and Salem, Massachusetts. Uh, that ultimately proved when we collected, I did personally most of this part, uh, similar cases that uh, made a clinical, uh, cri made clinical criteria that can be pulled together and made into one diagnosis, beryllium disease or beryllium poisoning but not barrelosis. That's one of my pet peeves because beryl is the ore that's in the earth and never has been known to cause any illness whatsoever. And yet due to Mackley, capital M-A-C-H-L-E, uh, who wrote an article in something like 1950 calling the disease berylosis or beryliosis, um, as was written by Fabroni, the Italian investigator from animals, caused, in my judgment, a lot of trouble and has a moral for this group, and that is to be very fussy about the terminology, mm -hmm. both for the sake of the patient and for the sake of ongoing literature. Uh, period. I think I think most of uh, the good work that I was able to do, not very flattering myself, am I? In the early days, was uh, a curious lack of interest among clinicians in uh, um, job-related illness, which always puzzled me, period. The kind of thing I speak of is man with very, a worker with very uh, low hemoglobin who was be being exposed to lead at his job. Well, all the other workers in his group had normal hemoglobins. And the answer to his problem was that he had leaded pipes on his farm and was milking his cow every day and using a lot of water from that source. And when he got rid of the source, his hemoglobin was as normal as any other. And my contribution had been uh, to discover where the lead came from and then go to the plant physician who was a surgeon in training and sit down with him and explain to him about stipple shell cells and hemoglobin and invite him to make the right diagnosis the next time. Yeah. This is so many years ago, I think I'm not hurting his feelings. <laughs> uh, the other kind of exciting aspect of this work is to discover new, quote, unquote, 
diseases, period. I have in mind that I believe it is true that I was the first uh, writing uh, clinician to speak about chronic cadmium poisoning. And of course, as you all know, there's been a large literature from Scandinavia and Britain uh, on the subject uh, since 1946. The period, what I did that I found so fascinating, I uh, had the right of entry with an ID card that I carried, but more than one factory used the World War II Questionable Secrecy Act to keep me out. But this particular plant, they invited me in, and I had, uh, stop me if I'm talking too long, <laughs> I had been to the library at Harvard and found some very old literature on what cadmium could do. And uh, I was able to identify in this relatively small plant um, a cadmium causing serious gastrointestinal trouble, uh, cadmium causing changes in bone, and uh, cadmium causing disturbance in liver function. And in looking at the plant, uh, later with an engineer, what we found was uh, they were using a big witch's cauldron to mix what cadmium um, compounds they wanted to use and generating a lot of gas that car or vapor that carried cadmium. And the man who was uh, taking care of the, um, what do you call them, uh, up in the air? <laughs> uh, you don't call them a lift. He's way up in the air and he's taking samples and so on. He had so much trouble he stayed in his cabin during lunch hour. And sure enough, he had kind of serious cadmium poisoning. And then we found Parenthetically, cadmium was used as a war gas in World War I, and I think a little in World War II. We found three or four of the men who worked at the, at the cauldron where the stuff was melted um, had uh, respiratory changes that we could measure on lung function studies. So there was a nice little rounded out uh, cause and effect because there were no other materials being used in this sort of big uh, airplane hangar sort of workplace. So I wrote that up and only took about two ba pages uh, to do the thing and sent it to a journal that shall be nameless and they turned it down because they they said they knew there was no such thing as chronic ca cadmium poisoning. And I found out later the editor was a, was a consultant for the company that made the cadmium that this company used and was also a con consultant to the company. Now that's probably enough about the who done its stories, but I found this absolutely fascinating. And clearly one couldn't do it without the help of chemists and engineers. And one really, I think, can't do it without a good clinical part of the training somewhere. Mm -hmm. uh, certainly uh, my uh, distress in talking to plant doctors and those who were engaged in the field was that they're training on the whole was so narrow and they hadn't any exposure to the engineers and the physicists and the chemists who knew about methods. So when the lead numbers came back, things of this sort, 
uh, the clinician was at a bad disadvantage and he usually made a mistake by saying, well, no, it can't be, because he didn't know anything about it. What do you think about the uh, status of occupational medicine training today? Well, compared to what Dr. Alice Hamilton had told me and what she put in her autobiography, we have a reason for hope that things are going ahead. Um, those who've read it will recall that she said after going to her first international meeting on industrial diseases that she was mortified and ashamed that the only paper at the meeting that was done by an American was a paper on tropical diseases uh, for people who lived in Florida. <laughs> and she herself had just a odd lib conversation when she saw what the trouble was about her lead experience, but she didn't have a paper to give. She hadn't been asked, and uh, the thing hadn't worked out in this country. Whereas I've been to uh, all of those meetings during my working life, and I've had a paper at each one, and there have been a fairly presentable congregation of people from European countries uh, and now more recently Asiatic, uh, South American, uh, as well as the United States. In fact, you won't be surprised to know that the United States has the poorest showing lately because within our country the clinicians have been inclined to join the AMA type organizations that are interested in this field rather than uh, the branch of the American Public Health Association that you represent or the state organizations. Yeah. Yeah. And this is kind of a pity. And of course the medical schools at Harvard, I sat on a committee trying to implore the faculty to put in occupational medicine as a bona fide course within uh, the training in clinical medicine. And I had a lot of friends and supporters, but when it came to actually putting in uh, a course in the field, uh, it usually got put down to two or three uh, lectures within the Department of Preventive Medicine and the rest of it went to the School of Public Health at yeah. Harvard yeah. where there was a great variation in my judgment in the people interested and knowledgeable in occupational medicine as such. Can you tell us a little bit about your early work with Alice Hamilton? Yes. Uh, it happened in the most pleasant possible way. After I read my first paper in public on the subject of um, beryllium disease in the fluorescent lamp industry in Salem and Danvers, she wrote me the nicest possible letter congratulating me on having written a paper. I've always remembered that and have taken liberty of writing one or two of my colleagues that I know have read papers that I've read because it really does give one quite a lift. Yes. Uh, the second letter from Dr. Alice was to invite me to have lunch with her at the Parker House in Boston, uh, which I did, and we each sat on the stool and I found out later she put her deaf ear towards me and said, Dr. Hardy, I think you're quite ready to help me with the second edition of my book, uh, Hamilton, Alice Hamilton Industrial Toxicology, and we'll call it Hamilton and Hardy, and that would be very nice. And she went down the table of contents and I thought she was hearing all I said, but she wasn't. 
And she would say, well, I will do the lead, but you do the mercury. I will do uh, the trichloroethylene, and you do the carbon tetrachloride. And so it went <laughs> down the list of contents. Well, I was saved considerable embarrassment by the fact that uh, I hadn't understood what she had in mind and there was a publishing strike just then. And this was the time when she was awarded the Browning Award and not to be exceed, ex, um, too excited about such things. I received it some years later. Well, it has $5,000 with it. And she took her sister to Guatemala and left me with the book. <laughs> And at the time, I was out at Los Alamos trying to look after the atom bomb. <laughs> uh, but I had loads of time to go over the manuscript and write the things that I was supposed to know about. And so the book got written. Uh, then I kept very closely in touch with her. and was invited to her house in Hadline for weekends quite often. And she had a sister, Margaret, that lived there too. And Margaret had been the head of a girl's school and a teacher herself and was somewhat, let's call it conservative. And Alice, as you may remember, was almost an, uh, well, she certainly was an activist. <laughs> At any rate, Miss Margaret, the one who was at home there, would say to me, now, Harriet, I hope you don't act like Alice. She <laughs> signs her name to every mysterious cause that she thinks is any good, and why she's not in jail, we don't know. <laughs> and Dr. Alice gave most wonderful answers. She turned to me without a smile and said, now, Harriet, uh, I'm the older. I will sign all the outrageous pieces of paper that come by, by that I think are honorable. And you go ahead and do the field work and find new diseases. And that's what we did. <laughs> and I would go and report to her uh, quite, quite often. And quite the nicest thing that happened uh, that made, made me very sorry over the years, one day she asked me if I would call her by her first name. And of course these days it would be nothing. But at the time she was in her 80s, and I belonged to the last century as far as manners are concerned. So I said, I'm sorry, Dr. Alice, I don't think I can. And she sighed deeply and said, no, I suppose you couldn't. <laughs> and I thought that was very touching and sort of dated us both. Yeah. yeah. Now I think you've got more than enough. Let me ask you just a couple of other questions. How, how do you think things have changed in the field of work or occupational health since when you first got into the field. Do you think we're facing the same kinds of problems, different problems? Well, I hope, and because the technological advances are so great, that there will be unknowns uh, to make your field more interesting. Now, we have to take into account the union movement. That is how active it is and how uh, sort of meek and mild it is varies enormously. And I think Dr. Alice had the same experience. Uh, the uh, management end of a business varies enormously from the owner who came and took his uh, coat off and called the other uh, colleagues at the cadmium plant and we all sat around the to table and I told them what I wanted to do and they voted yes right then and there. That's very rare. Uh, mostly the management is either too busy 
or they give you to some poor safety officer who has been told to always see that management comes out with a clean sheet. Uh, I'm afraid that is still true. I only have uh, really two journals these days, the Journal of Industrial Medicine, Lloyd Tepper, the editor, editor used to work with me at the Mass General, but I'm afraid he's more interested in management than I am, although he's doing a lot, I can see, to try and make things better, because he saw during his years at the Mass General how perfectly uh, obtuse and blocking uh, management and the lawyers uh, can be. I also think, especially in Massachusetts, the state has been very slow uh, to give real two teeth into this study. Uh, the way it was written in the statute books, the uh, officials of the labor department called in inspectors had police powers, mm -hmm. but in my experience, they never used them. They used to go with me once in a while, and I learned a lot from them, but they were certainly timid about ever showing any signs of forcing my, my entry if the guard at the gate said, we have war secrets, Dr. Hardy can't come in. Uh, that seemed to me a lot of foolishness. But I, from what I've heard from others like you and read in the journals, that may still be true. And unfortunately, the MDs are much too docile about guarding uh, management because they get put in an awkward place mm -hmm. by high salaries and things of that kind. How do you think we're doing at the federal level? Well, we went through per perfectly terrible at the time when uh, you have to go way back to uh, uh, to Dr. Alice and Mary Switzer's time. Uh, they were very fiery and got things done, and uh, so did uh, Dr. Elliot. Um, as she was uh, child labor and very fiery, and belonged to the Boston group of hotheads. <laughs> and uh, it was never dull in Boston. There were enough left of the revolutionary spirited people, so there was always something uh, that was being fought over. Um, so the federal government up until, uh, what do we say, almost to Reagan's time, was pretty good, except for not being willing to fight uh, for entry into the plants. And this dairy varied a lot from state to state. And the federal people, it seemed to me, one could uh, accuse, as I do some of the Massachusetts people, of a, a kind of timid attitude uh, towards enforcing the laws they've already got in books. And the people that have headed the EPA don't strike one as terribly courageous. But fighting a man like Reagan, I'm sure, has been very difficult. And as long as you take it out, I'll tell you I'm going to vote for Mr. Dukakis, and that's one of the reasons. I wanted to ask you, I saw over on your coffee table that you have a little very much uh, so. a little button that says I'm a card-carrying right. member of the ACLU. I've it didn't to leave for much years. doubt to me. Yes, you're quite right. <laughs> My sister and I both are very fiery about it. And you'll be glad to know some of the old parties that live here are pure department. Do caucus people. Are you doing some organizing in the building? Uh, no, that's been outlawed by mutual consent. I see. We have too many traditional Republicans and traditional Democrats and 
since we only have one meal together a day, yeah. it seems as though we probably shouldn't settle political differences. Even peace. Right. Yeah. I guess I would ask you to sort of wrap it up. If you had a few words of wisdom or a few words of advice to give our section, people being physicians, occupational and industrial hygienists, safety people, nurses, uh, labor activists, and others. If you had a few words of wisdom to say to them, to encourage them to keep up the good fight, what would you say? Based on my own experience, I would say don't be afraid <laughs> of charging ahead. Uh, one, enforcing it on uh, laws that are on the books, even if you have to go and help get some of the help of some of the lawyers who are interested in this field. And uh, doing anything you can, especially the occupational hygienists, in getting things out of the EPA laws and getting different de decent diagnoses made. Because uh, I think a lot of things fall down because, uh, I was going to name my own chemist, but there aren't first-class chemists always in these groups. But I know there are many older uh, chemists who would be glad to help in an advisory mm -hmm. capacity. And what you need is as strong an arm as you can get. I'm sure you know enough to stay away from the newspapers. They've always been a great trial because the truth is not in them. I reported once to a man from the government who asked me what would be my best guess about how many more beryllium cases would come to the fore and die. And I didn't want to answer it, but I foolishly gave him a number. And the very next week, in the English medical journal, journal Lancet, they published a figure ten times what I had said and said that that was what I believed. And I cabled in that uh, I was starting a lawsuit as quickly as I could, and so I got a cable back saying he'd withdrawn his statement. <laughs> but they are rascals. Uh, you probably know, or if you don't, it's good to know, that the headlines are written by a different man than the one who writes the article. I wrote a letter to the Springfield paper the other day and uh, suggested that the opinion they had written about lead poisoning, the headline said, lead poisoning rampant, or some such thing as that. And when I read the article, the word lead did not appear. Hmm. And apparently it had not occurred to the editor uh, of either to have a look at the other fellow's work. I said it made them look like fools. <laughs> <laughs> now, you fellows can't take your time to go charging around doing that sort of thing, but that you'll get the chance, I'm sure. Well, thank you, Dr. Hardy. It's been, You're very it's welcome. been a pleasure. To come and speak about Dr. Harriet Hardy uh, is another person that knows her, and that's Tony Mizaki, who is not one of those meek and mild union people that Harriet might have referred to in her comments. So I'd like to ask Tony to come up and say a few words about Dr. Hardy. Well, it's really an honor to talk about Dr. Hardy because she's probably the single person who introduced me to this whole question of occupational health and safety through another friend of mine who I mentioned last year at the APHA 
meeting. Uh, that was Leo Goodman, who was the Atomic Energy Technical, technical Advisor to uh, Walter Ruther. Uh, I had um, organized, when I was a local union organizer, a plant in Long Island, Hicksville, Long Island, nuclear fuel element plant, Silcor, was a consortium, Sylvania and Corning. And this particular plant was making fuel elements, most about 85% for the military, for the tritium extraction reactor at Savannah River. And 15% of the work they were doing, I went for the Fermi uh, Fairs breeder that was being built at Laguna Beach in Michigan. And um, the doctor who uh, the company brought in to negotiate the health and safety clause, and it was interesting, it was the first time I had negotiated on health and safety in this nuclear facility was a doctor who was involved with the company in World War II, Sylvania, dealing with um, the beryllium that was in the fluorescent lights that killed many young women who worked in that facility. And that's when Dr. Hardy's name first was introduced to me, 1963. And we had asked Dr. Hardy around that period to help us with some of the brilliant problems we had in the aircraft industry on Long Island. Um, as a result of being introduced to this woman, I learned something about occupational health. Uh, I was given a background. I heard Dr. Hamilton's name for the first time. I understood something in the history of this issue I knew very little about. I was introduced into uh, occupational health and safety through the beryllium issue. And in 1972, uh, I met with Dr. Hardy through Dave Wegman, who was up here at the time, over a beryllium episode in, at a company called Kawiki Berylko in uh, Pennsylvania. And Dr. Hardy actually helped design that facility, the health and safety aspect of it. And we organized it at that time. And uh, there were severe beryllium problems that Dr. Hardy, her first reaction was they could not exist because the design was so perfect. What she did not know was that management, when confronted with the productivity imperative, cast off all the uh, design qualities and features that Dr. Hardy had contributed to in that particular facility. So uh, that is an episode that a great deal has been written about. And I'm proud to say now that as a result of uh, Dr. Hardy's efforts in introducing me into occupational health and safety and introducing me into uh, the knowledge about Dr. Alice Hamilton, one of my first uh, effective contributions as a result of being elected recently was to create, have OCAW create the Alice Hamilton Memorial Library. We actually have the Alice Hamilton Memorial Library, which we hope a lot of you who, who write and develop papers and there's no place else who will accept them, this library will. And uh, uh, we actually, our board two weeks ago, uh, filed, had the first meeting in the Alice Hamilton Memorial Library. And uh, uh, Dr. Hardy uh, will be viewing this tape, and I want to say to Dr. Hardy, it was her initial effort that spurred me on. And uh, hopefully, uh, it's been infectious, and other people have been affected by this stream of continuity from Hamilton to Hardy to Herb Abrams and countless others who aren't even here uh, to a whole new generation of activists. And I certainly appreciated what Dr. Hardy had to say about activism. So it really is an honor and a pleasure to honor Dr. Hardy. And I hope that we all have the opportunity to read her book, uh, to honor her by carrying on in the most vigorous fashion possible the work that both her and Dr. Hamilton contributed so much to. Thank you. Okay, our final speaker this evening uh, represents the next generation of occupational health physicians and a person that knows Dr. Harriet Hardy, and that's Dr. Chris Oliver from Mass General Hospital. And I'd like to ask Chris to come up and say a few words. It's a pleasure for me to be here tonight to honor Dr. Hardy 
And I'd like to say, if you like the tape, I have here her autobiography, which I strongly recommend, called Challenging Man-Made Disease. And I'm going to read a few excerpts from this book tonight because I think these um, pieces of, of her autobiography describe the quali some of the qualities about her which I most admire. And there was one quote which I believe she told me, and I cannot find Dr. Hardy who said this about you, but I think this is one of the greatest things that could be said about anybody, and that is, Dr. Hardy, Harriet, you're your own man. And I think, I think throughout her life, she in fact illustrated those qualities and was very much her own person from the time that she picked preventive medicine as a specialty when crisis-oriented health care was really what everyone was doing throughout the, the, all of the years of her life, including the, the tape that we just saw. Um, as all of you know and has been said here today, when Dr. Hardy was working for the Division of Occupational Hygiene here in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, she put beryllium disease on the map when she was investigating Salem sarcoid. And one of the comments which she had, I don't know whether I can manipulate my glasses and read here but I'll with these two microphones, but I'll try. I may be the next, the next generation, but as you can see, I'm aging rapidly. I need my glasses desperately. Um, Hello? Following the publication of her article about chronic beryllium disease, she said, things were never dull after this. Officials of the Atomic Energy Commission, then known as the Manhattan District, came to see me when the article was published in the fall of 1946. They suggested that if I were right, they were in trouble. And of course, used to speaking the truth, I said, well, you are in trouble. <laughs> Now, um, I, I have two more excerpts to read. The second has also to do with beryllium. Part of the beryllium story reflects both my quick temper and the chaos in the beryllium industry in the 1950s. Two young men from a company manufacturing explosives came to my office seeking knowledge of beryllium toxicity. They would not tell me what the beryllium was to be used for. I gave my facts and showed them chest x-rays. They seemed mildly impressed and mentioned that the president of the company that would supply the beryllium had told them that there were no cases in his plant. This president was my number one enemy just then because he had published an article in a business magazine stating that beryllium toxicity is a myth. Turning to my visitors and rapidly losing my temper, I asked if they had wives and children. Both did. I then pulled from my desk preserved samples of autopsy specimens that came from workers made ill in that plant. The young men became silent. And then finally, because many of us here do medical legal work, I do medical legal work, her thoughts and experience with regard to the area of medical legal uh, issues was a great interest to me. And um, I quote from her as follows. This work began for me in 1953 and continues in the form of writing position papers and giving advice by telephone to patients, lawyers, and doctors. One day a sheriff came to my home while I was away to deliver a summons for me to appear as a witness at a so-called hearing before the Industrial Accident Board. My mother living with me at the time and awed by the legal papers took them. This was a mistake. For a fee of two dollars, such sheriffs are expected to give the summons only to the witness named. Without legal advice at that time, but never since, I went to the hearing as a witness. This means that I was legally bound only to read out of the record the worker was dead, specific facts such as pulse rate and laboratory findings, but I was not expected to interpret or give an opinion of work relationship, the crucial factor. Not knowing this, I answered questions put to me by the insurance company lawyer who had a medical text open on his desk and asked me to discuss cirrhosis of the liver, the worker's disease. I began, but he interrupted saying, Dr. Hardy, that is not what it says in this book. I promptly lost my temper, which had been oozing away for the last few hours. In a loud voice, I mentioned that my medical education at Cornell was far superior to his use of a sentence in a text. 
on and on it went until the commissioner ordered us to stop. In the end, my side, that of the dead man, won. I, like a winning prize fighter, went to the opposing lawyer, shook his hand, and invited him to lunch with me at the MGH to discuss the case. And I think these, um, uh, these quotes illustrate, at, at least for me, the type of person that Dr. Hardy was. In addition to admiring about her the fact that she was and continues to be her own person, as someone who takes care of patients, her dedication to the care of the individual patient, as well as her relentless pursuit of the truth looking at groups of workers, has been very important to me in my own practice of occupational medicine. And Dr. Hardy, I just want to thank you for the model that you've given to all of us here, and to me particularly. On behalf of the Occupational Health and Safety Section for her dedication to and her great courage in the pursuit of worker health and safety, we would like to present the 1988 Alice Hamilton Award to Dr. Harriet Hardy. Accepting for Dr. Hardy, who is unable to be with, be with us here tonight, is Dr. Les Bowden, a representative of that Boston group of hotheads, the Harriet Hardy Institute. Thanks a lot. It's a great honor for me to be here as a past chair of the Harriet Hardy Institute, which was also a great honor for me. And I'd just like to say that Harriet Hardy has been, for many of us, myself included, a wonderful role model both for her lifelong commitment to the health and safety of workers and uh, perhaps even more so for her lifelong commitment to always speaking the truth, as I think you all could get a, a good view of from her tape. Thanks again.